The physical examination never makes the diagnosis, but it supports the history. If what you told me on history, I expect to see on physical. So the physical examination is not an independent event. You don't just do the same thing every time. You do what you do based on what the patient told you. It begins by observing your patient. Look at your patient. You know this. This is, this is physical examination 101. Watch the patient's behavior. Watch the general and, and activity in the office. Watch how they sit. Watch how they move. The patient that says, I can't sit for more than five minutes and took you 20 minutes of sitting to tell you that, you've got a problem. Be aware of that. Look at the back. Be, be the back specific things, and these are the things you look for. The contour, the color, the scars. Palpate if you must. I can't stop you. You're all going to poke them anyway. You get nothing out of it. It doesn't tell you anything. The pain is not related to the site of the, of the underlying mechanical cause. It just, you know, it hurts. My back hurts. Poke it. Yeah, it hurts. Okay, good. <laughs> right, got that. Right. So in mechanical pain, the palpation is not, not particularly helpful. The rule here is very simple. If it's subtle, it's irrelevant. Just, just stop worrying about the little stuff. If, it, if you can see it, if you and I can agree that that back has a curve in it, oh, that looks like the guy belongs in France in a bell tower, then you've got a problem. All right? But the idea that this is a, a oh, I think it's, no, no, it isn't. Yeah, no, it isn't. It isn't. Forget it. The, the changes in mechanical pain that you will see on observation are obvious. The second thing I want you to do is have everybody bend forward and everybody bend backward. Why? Because question three said, does bending forward make your typical pain worse? So guess what I want you to do? I want you to bend forward. And when you bend forward, guess what I'm going to ask you? Did that make your typical pain worse? And the answer is yes if you said yes or no if you said no. And the physical has to fit the history. It's that simple. Bending backward opens the door to treatment strategies. And that's why we do that, to see what bending backward does in terms of relief or aggravation of the pain. Now, you can test side bending. You can test rotation. I know that in the, in the angst bond group, side bending is, is an issue. The trouble is, in mechanical pain, everybody who hurts bending forward and backward also hurts to rotate and side bend. You want to make a back hurt? Have them bend slightly and twist, and they'll go, ow. So it doesn't tell me anything. This is, this is about syndrome recognition. This is, I get to this discussion when I talk to the, to the physical therapists, and they say, well, we all test rotation because the job requires rotation. I have to test rotation. Of course you do. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying that your pattern recognition, the basis of your treatment strategy, is based on what happens when I bend forward and what happens when I bend back. And it's not range of movement. Measuring range of movement in a one-off examination is a waste of time. No, yes, yes my, my fingers touch the floor. Okay, that means you've got long arms. Right? <laughs> it, you know, if there's a change over time, that's different, but this is not syndrome recognition. A digression, and this will be a, we'll, we'll do a little demonstration and we'll, this will take a moment. I used to just rush past this. I used to say, okay, everybody gets an irritative test, everybody. And the irritative test that's most commonly used is straight leg raising. And so, the, oh, that's right, straight leg raising. So, the next thing I discovered was that people don't agree on what is a positive straight leg raise. And I thought everybody knew and agreed, but we don't. So we need now to find out what constitutes a positive straight leg raise. Does anybody like to embarrass themselves by... <laughs> oh, go ahead, somebody... You were brave, I won't ask you again, that was good. Anybody want to tell me what in their practice, if you write in your office note, SLR positive, what have you seen? Anybody want to try? Anybody want to get to a microphone and see? What have you seen when you say SLR positive, what is it? So they, <clears throat> they get to increase back pain when you do the leg raise or you okay, so do the tripod. Pain, they get back pain with leg raise. Yeah. Okay, let me just ask you a question. Who lifted the leg, you or the patient? You. Okay. Very good. I was surprised to discover that a number of family doctors let the patient do it. That they, the, the patient, they lift their leg and he lifts the leg, they constitute a straight, that's not a straight leg race. Okay? That's, that is, it's a passive test. Okay? 
Number two, let me ask you this before I go on to the rest of my little list. What is the test testing? When I do an SLR, what is it I'm assessing? Sorry? Okay, sciatic nerve, meaning irritation thereof? Yes. Yes, okay, and it's actually the roots of the nerve, okay, to be picky. It's the roots of the sciatic nerve. But I'm testing root irritation. Is that, is that correct? All right. Where does root irritation hurt? You all agreed with me a while ago when I told you that radicular pain is leg dominant pain. So a positive straight leg raise must be reproduction of the patient's typical leg pain. This is hugely not done. Back pain is not relevant. Now, it may be present, but hell, this is the guy that hurts to bend forward. Oh, that hurts. Well, lie down, I'll lift your leg up, that amounts to bending forward, lying down, and they get back pain again. So this is back pain. This is mechanical. This is not a positive test. You can record it. Straight leg raising produced back pain. Good, got it. That tells me it's mechanical. But a positive test is reproduction of the patient's typical leg dominant pain. Now this raises a very interesting question. I'll give you a history of having, my, my history, I have back pain. I've had back pain for six months and the pain is in my back and my buttock and it radiates around my hip. And that's the only place it's ever been. Okay? And that's an accurate history. When you examine me, what is the chance I will have a positive straight leg raise? How many people think there's a good chance? How many people think there's a one good chance? How many people think there's a small chance? How many people don't think? <laughs> right. Anybody here prepared to say there's no chance? Yeah, absolutely, no chance. That is the correct answer. This is what gets me going. The history said I've never had leg dominant pain. How can you reproduce or exacerbate the leg dominant pain I never had. If you listen to the history, it gives you the answer. Now, does that mean you don't do the test? Of course not. Because patients, this will amaze you, patients don't always tell the truth. Isn't, isn't, is, that, is, that, is that an amazing fact or what? You take a history and it's wrong. Oh, my goodness. Right. So basically, you do this test to confirm or refute the history. The patient said, I never have leg pain. The test can't be positive if the history is accurate. I had a woman, I'll tell a story. Julie's heard it a thousand times. This was in Edmonton on a course, and I was teaching, and I had a real live patient, and she, I took her history, and it was all back pain. And I lifted her leg to show how to do an SLR, and she said, ah, oh, pain. And I said to the group, I said, that's back pain. That doesn't count. And she said, no, no, that's my leg pain. That's embarrassing because I just took the history. And I said, what leg pain? Because you said you didn't have leg pain. And she said, I knew you were teaching a back course. I didn't think you wanted to hear about my leg pain. That's exactly what she told me. So the test brought out a mistake in my history. And that's the purpose of the physical, to confirm or refute what I've heard. What degree of elevation? How many are in the 45 degrees to be positive group? 60 degrees to be positive group? Come on, you're all taught this in medical school. It's positive between 30 and 60 or 15 and 20, who cares? The correct answer is any degree of elevation. The higher you go, the less the root is irritated. But it's still a positive test. If I reproduce your typical leg dominant pain at any degree of elevation, that is a positive test. Positive at 30, 20, means you've got a hot root. Positive at 80, 90, means the root's not so hot anymore. And when you track sciatics over time, this is what happens to the SLR. It goes from being very limited to better and better and better, but the test is still positive if the pain is reproduced on the straight leg race. Now, 
Anybody know why this limit was put in, the 65 or 70 or whatever? The reason is, of course, because people get confused with hamstring tightness. Hamstring irritability appears in the upper elevations. Well, first of all, that's not the history. No patients come to me ever and said, doctor, I'm here in your office because I have hamstring tightness. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. They come with leg dominant pain that I reproduce, that's a positive test. Confusing with straight leg raising, confusing straight leg raising because of hamstring tightness means you didn't listen to the history. But there's another way out of this, and I need a, I need a volunteer. I need a, a lady or gentleman wearing slacks, so. Okay, now, one of the things that we conventionally do in testing is we test the patient sitting, and we say, okay, let's just have a look at your foot. Okay, so I lift up her foot, and I examine her toes, or I do her Babinski or whatever. What's my degree of straight leg raising? 90 degrees. Okay, simple, easy, 90 degrees of SLR. Do the other side, same thing, 90 degrees, no problem, it's done, okay? Now, put the patient lying down on your back, look up at the ceiling. When you lie a patient down, always say, lie on your back, look at the ceiling. Have you noticed that? If you say, lie on your back, and you're a back patient, they lie on their stomach because they expect you to be looking at their back. So, so I find if I say, lie on your back, look at the ceiling, I only get 10% that lie on their stomach. So. <laughs> now, I'm going to have the patient lying here with both legs down. We've already demonstrated a, a nice, easy 90 degrees of, of no trouble. I'm going to lift your leg, and I want you to tell me when you feel discomfort in your hamstrings. Okay? Yep. Now, this is the classic variance of straight leg raising, right? This is right out of the wobble, non-organic signs. I had 90 when she was sitting. I've got 60 when she's lying down. Now she's telling me it hurts, yep. okay? She's malingering. <laughs> right? Now, the mistake, of course, is not hers, it's mine, because it's not the same test. The test that I did sitting is not what I just did lying down. When I take her opposite leg and put it down like this, okay, now watch what happens to her straight leg raise. That's good. Yeah. See that? Isn't that amazing? And I don't rehearse this any. I used to rehearse it ahead of time, but I don't have to. It's always the same. I always gain at least 20 degrees of elevation. Right? So where this was painful, now it's not. Okay? Gone. That's hamstring tightness taken care of every single time. So when you do the test, routinely flex the opposite leg, do this, that's my 90. Did I they give you your typical pain, the one you never had? No, it didn't. Same thing on the other side, and that's a positive test, okay? Now, last little point. People say, well, what about doing it this way? You know, holding it, this is what Lesage actually did describe, you know, 1990, and then extend the knee. Or what about the one where you bring the leg up to, to oop, drop it, dorsiflex the ankle? That's called Brigard's test. That was the, the guy that described that. Okay, and it reproduces the same leg dominant pain. Or the bowstring, where I put my thumbs in the popliteal fossa and I press in on the nerve and it hurts. Same thing. Every one of those tests reproduces the patient's typical pain. The tests are all the same. So if I've got a patient with leg dominant pain and I lay her down on the table and I do this and you go, ow, and I say, is that your pain? And you say, yes, the test is done. It's done, I've got it, I've got it. I don't have to then drop it down and then do, oh, there it is again, okay, that's twice. <laughs> All right. Oh, I can hurt you another way, watch this. <laughs> yeah. And so basically what I'm doing is reproducing, now if I don't like my patient, yeah. I, I'll hurt her as often as I can. Yeah. Yeah. But for someone who I'm trying to help, once I've reproduced the pain, and it is the pain, it's the typical leg dominant pain, the test is done. It's over. Does that make sense? So that's a, that's, thank you very much. That's a positive straight leg. <coughs> oh, by the way, before you leave, um, you've, you've just demonstrated something which is really important. I do these tests, I'm describing the tests sort of in this list, but the order in which I do them is based on patient comfort. 
So what I will do is every test that I want to do standing, and in the core tool, there's all of these, and they're, they're, they're broken out according to position, as you'll see. Because when I get you to do the test, you know, stand up for me, please. You're, you, now you're in the office. We've just finished talking. Please bend down, touch your toes. OK, OK. All right, does, that, does that bring on your typical pain? Yes, no. OK, and that's fine. Femoral stretch is nothing more than straight leg raising upside down. I use it occasionally when the patient's history is leg dominant pain in the anterior thigh. That's femoral root irritation. I don't do it routinely. You can do it if you like it, but you're not likely to get a big return on your investment because L3-4 don't make up more than about 10% of the total root involvement. Root conduction tests. Everybody gets screened for the commonest root involvement, which is either L4, L5, or S1. If I toss in L3, the, the, the research I just read puts that at 96% of all the root involvement. So this is, this is all of them. What I recommend you do is this. Everybody gets a knee reflex done. That's pretty standard. I mean, I, I say this is more of a doctor reflex than a patient reflex. If you're in the examining room and the patient's sitting on the examining table and you have a hammer in your hand, you will hit their knees. Try that the next time and don't. Just you know, put the hammer in your hand have pay, and try not to hit their knees. You can't, you can't help yourself. You just go over and you sort of tap it. That's L4. L5 is extending the big toe. You hold the big toe up, I push the big toe down. That's L5. S1 is you curl the big toe in, I pull the big toe straight. That's S1. Those three tests are sufficient. This is not a neurological examination. This is a back examination. And so we are focusing on the areas in the back that cause the problem. And so we test L4, L5, and S1. We can add other things for five. We can add other things for one. They're in the core tool. These things are there if you want them. But the things that I want you to do are screen four, five, one. There are two tests left. Everybody gets an upper motor test. Every back patient is tested for upper motor. Whether it is a, a plantar response, whether it's clonus, every patient gets tested. Because any evidence of upper motor completely negates a mechanical pattern. The minute I get something going on higher up, it's not a mechanical pattern. There is never a positive upper motor finding in low back ever. So be very clear about this and it must be done because I have seen upper motor findings masquerade as an L5 or an S1. I mean, certainly anybody who's been in practice any time has, has seen this. I've seen it with tumors, I've seen it with MS, I've seen it with all sorts of weird things that trigger and you get fooled unless you do an upper motor. The final thing everybody gets is saddle sensation. Here we go again. Question four. Has, since the start of your pain, has there been a change in your bowel bladder function? We back this up by testing saddle. Now, saddle sensation can be effectively tested in the midline between the upper buttocks. You don't have to grope the patient to test saddle sensation. All you have to do is test touch between the upper buttocks, midline, that is subtended by sacrals two, three, four. And what I tell people if they say, well, how far down do I have to, to, to stroke, is if you go out on the street, you see a teenage boy, you see where he's wearing his jeans, <clears throat> you can test saddle sensation without moving his clothing. So it, you don't have to go very far. But do it on everyone. Make it routine. Just an automatic, last thing I do, you're lying in your stomach, just test the saddle because you'll never miss the cauda equina syndrome. And the neat part is, if you do this test and you forgot to ask question four, my god, I forgot to ask bowel bladder, but here I am, last thing I'm doing is stroking this midline upper buttocks. Why am I, oh yes, sacral, forgot to ask, has there been a change in bowel bladder? So it's a memory check. It makes sure you never get out without asking this question. You could, do it you could do it standing up. 
I just, I, ultimately they're going to wind up in, in, in the examination, I'm going to eventually get them lying face down, so I'll do it then. But yes, you can certainly do it standing up. Do it, I don't care when you do it as long as it gets done. And then make that part of the exam. So I call those the high-low tests, and they're mandatory. Upper motor, lower sacral. Everybody gets them. The rest is pretty obvious. You can sensory test if you feel like it. I tend not to, except for saddle. I've given up sensory testing. I don't get much return on my investment for testing. You don't, big toes a bit numb. OK, big toes a bit numb. Um, you can test other things if you need to. And this, again, depends on the history, depends on the story. I'll test this, the hip function. I'll certainly test peripheral pulses, maybe an abdominal exam. Whatever else is added into this, depending on the pattern that you heard on history. So we've got three questions and two tests. Where is your pain the worst? Is that pain constant or intermittent? Has there been a change in your bowel bladder since your pain started? I can now rule out if the pain is intermittent and back dominant. There goes my cancer worries. There goes my infection worries. If there's been no change in bowel bladder, there goes my cauda worries. All of these things are done on the first, on these questions. Then the two tests are upper motor, there goes my cord tumors, there goes my demyelinating diseases, and low sacral, and I'm right back to cauda quina, the only true surgical emergency in low back. And that's it. That is the entire examination.